Welcome to Access to Perspectives Conversations. Today we talk with Lambert Heller. Welcome, Lambert. Hi, Joe. Thank you for having me. So happy to be on your show. It's a great pleasure. We've met a couple of years ago, and we've also engaged with each other through various open science events, amongst others with the German chapter of Wikimedia Open Science Fellows Program and some other related events. Um, you work in Hannover at the TIB. Wait. Mm -hmm. um, Which is, uh, yeah, sorry. Oh, please go ahead. Which is uh, TIB is uh, Leibniz Information Center for Science and Technology, um, uh, non university research uh, organization, and uh, at the same time, a research library uh, here in Germany. Yeah. yeah. Great. Yeah. Um, the German acronyms and then the English uh, counterpart of the name can be confusing. So thanks for filling us in here. Um, you've been engaged also for many years now with open science themes. Could you tell us a little bit about your career transaction and what got you involved in the open science? I don't, would you call it a movement or like how do you see open science initiatives and activities in the past, over the past decade perhaps, and today? Is oh, that's a very interesting question, Joe. Oh, um, yeah. Uh, okay, okay. First, let me try to get the autobiographic part right. Uh, so, what um, uh, catched my attention? Uh, yeah, okay. Maybe I can start this way. Um, around 2005 or so, I was uh, I lived in Berlin, and I uh, did um, so. So there's a German thing in, in the German academic library landscape, which is called Bibliotheksreferendariat. It's kind of a postgraduate trainee program, two-year program, where you have at the same time um, a master's degree in library and information science, at, as it is called, at Humboldt University in Berlin. And at the same time, you practice, so you work as an academic library, a librarian. So this is what I did at that at that time. And uh, together with a colleague back then, Patrick Danowski, who's also still very active, very creative mind in the library and openness landscape, so to say, um, Patrick and me, we came up with the label of uh, uh, Bibliothek 2.0, which is a German translation for library 2.0. And uh, the older listeners, <laughs> might remember of the web 2.0 thing I, I i don't know if it is still it's still for me am i old so, so, so. Sorry, that makes me old <laughs> okay. sorry for me. that well, we know. are we are but but um so, so the thing is uh, people went crazy uh like uh, 16 or 17, uh, 17 years ago about the thing that they discovered that the web is not only a one directional traditional mass media but it turns out okay people can contribute can actively participate and so patrick and me uh, attached ourselves to this library 2.0 movement and we were we were going crazy about this idea okay um libraries can be a participative uh, space too they can um uh, empower users and so on and okay this was uh, at that time interesting and soon after that i discovered that it's maybe not so interesting to uh, only just to think about or mainly to think about the future of libraries but instead um, the future of what researchers actually do so researchers from the perspective of academic libraries are our users also of course that's the same right but um so libraries traditionally um, um uh, are in a um, helping and um assisting role and this is what I so I identi identify myself as a librarian still so I see my, so I, I once uh, I, I have a degree also in social science but mostly I identify as a librarian so I'm super interested in having this uh, typical this classical library idea of serving um, 
alongside the research cycle to what um, researchers do. So from um, uh, gathering information, processing them, uh, coming up with new research data, storing and making accessible the research data and uh, publish about them, uh, uh, engage in multiple forms of discourse and so on and so on, all of this. And uh, so uh, what, what uh, came on my radar um, via people like, for instance, Sascha Friesicke and Sönke Bartling back then, who um, uh, wrote that book, um, Opening Science, which I uh, then contributed to. Um, we were uh, all like, um, uh, open access is not even enough. So, so open access does just mean that you have like digital copies of the traditional journal paper and make them freely available, which is nice and which is important, but it's by far not enough. So we have to see uh, the research cycle, um, the, the research work as a whole. And back then, uh, people thought we were lunatics because why do we need that? We have we have open access, and this changed a lot. And this is maybe a one one I mean pretty obvious thing uh, about open science that back then it certainly was a crazy idea and a grassroots movement or so. And by now it changed a lot, obviously. So you have multiple. Uh, a million euro heavy policies um, put in place by European Commission demanding that you do open science. And if you write a grant proposal, <laughs> you have to explain how you do open science, stuff like this. Mm -hmm. And uh, you have lots of jobs that have open science in the job title, in the job description at universities, at libraries, anywhere else. So mm -hmm. this changed a lot, certainly. And sometimes you also wonder if it is also good. So we have also, uh, but, but maybe we can talk about this separately. But what concerns me a lot about this development is that also uh, big commercial publishers um, uh, uh, stepped on this train and um, use uh, open science uh, as part of their branding by now, and uh, sometimes in a highly problematic way. So for instance, we have companies like um, Elsevier who do not call themselves a publisher anymore, but an information analytics business. Yeah. And by that, they mean that they um, have huge digital platforms and uh, they work in a way and uh, they are incentivized in a way. Um, I, I, so I, I will only scratch the surface here, yeah. uh, but, but, but it's closely intertwined with this whole system of, of how the um, reputation systems uh, in science work today. And uh, that makes sure that uh, the data that people contribute uh, while they work with the data, while they discover things, work with things and so on, uh, from from original research data to journal publish uh, things to preprints to whatever, um, that uh, all this data ends up in the hands of Elsevier and they trade with the data. Uh, they do lots of things, lots of stuff that is um, not comprehensible from the outside, not reproducible. They put it into um, recommendation algorithms that nobody understands. And uh, this hurts science. So this is really a danger and it's highly problematic. And at the same time, these guys call what they do and what they uh, have on their platforms open science. And here you see the tension, right? So, so on the one hand, it is a super um, a successful concept and I'm glad about this. And it's a great achievement, I guess, that we have lots of research data management officers in each and every university and stuff which is really fine. But on the same time, you must, you simply ha have to uh, recognize that uh, people like these big publishers uh, use this term and uh, mean uh, uh, quite a different thing uh, by uh, the term open science. Yeah, I, I agree. And also like, if you look up the term other than in Wikipedia, but there's many different definitions for open science, what's meant to be inclusive of open science. You said already 
that it's more than just open access, and that's already a good thing, as we agree, um, but it should go way beyond. And um, what we find on Wikipedia is that open science is also comprised of, of open source software and hardware, open peer review, open educational resources, open methodologies. Um, is there any of these principles or pillars of open science that's particularly important to you as a librarian, where you see that you also have a responsibility as a custodian of research practice and also an ability to serve open science, which might be nothing less and nothing more than good scientific practice at the end of the day. So it's really nothing new. It's just like, like my definition of open science is, a, is to claim back research integrity into the digital era. We have new tools, new platforms, new platforms, new services, and that made it difficult and also hard to understand what service for what purpose. And now we're aligning the two again, trying to, or with a goal of being or serving research integrity as we practice science. Is that how you also see it? Or what do you think the term open science? Um, yeah, what, what is the terminology open science and the various definitions bring to mind from your perspective in the library? Okay, that's, I don't know, I think five questions in one. Good luck. <laughs> We're all ears. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I, I, I'm, I'm fine. Um, so, um, yeah. So uh, we have, um, um, we came up last week, just last week, <laughs> with a new idea. We will have a first German Open Science Festival in Hanover. So we do this STIB together with the University of Hanover and their research department specifically. And uh, so look it up, OpenScienceFestival.de. Um, and uh, so our worldview, <laughs> so to say, no, but our analysis on what is important right now for uh, open science, uh, you can see it by just looking at the two main topics of our two panels there. So the first one is named uh, open science is just science done right, mm -hmm. <laughs> which is an old slogan of the open science movement and with, which we still believe it's true. So this is about, okay, um, so, so you, mm, yeah, as you traditionally expect from science to have like integrity, to have like um, uh, an openness about uh, uh, what they actually do, what data they work with and how, and how they come to their conclusions. This is uh, in a way, so, so open science is another implementation of this. So there are certain practices now in the age of data science and software-based science uh, which implement these core old ideas, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe we can agree on that. Mm -hmm. And uh, the other uh, panel, by the way, is named Who Owns Science, oh, yeah. which is about what I already mentioned, um, that these platforms, as harmless as they seem, uh, which seem to be there to help researchers do their work, communicate their work, often... Uh, work in a quite different direction and that is um, collecting data and reusing uh, the whole of the data that is collected in ways that cannot be controlled anymore and this is a political or economic political uh, level so to say and uh, we definitely need more sovereignty of researchers and researcher communities themselves so we cannot allow certain companies to own this apparatus, but we must make sure that we have platforms uh, which make use of open source software and mostly which are understood and driven by scholars and by researchers uh, independently. Um, uh, from my perspective, this is an important new, uh, uh, depends on how you see it, but uh, so this is like a response to a more recent danger uh, that, 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 that we can see now. Uh, was that uh, even an answer to your question? I think so, um, no, totally, yeah. Somehow, yeah, okay, okay. Mm -hmm. I think we agree very much. Uh, a couple of days ago, 
we, as, um, I spoke with Mark Hanna, the director of Figshare, and he said himself, and he, he also pointed out, I'm the director of this company. And I say here openly that I don't want Figshare to become a monopoly anywhere in the world or in any sphere of research because that would be healthy. So basically Figshare sees itself as an organization, as one actor in the ecosystem of open scholarship with yes, a for-profit mandate or um, tax system. And also they decided for this tax status for practical reasons, which doesn't necessarily mean that they're evil as, I don't know, you can see others. But I see what you mean also with some of the bigger players, um, like the big five publishers, who now ride the wave of open science now that it's become so much acceptance amongst the research community. And I also find it threatening or scary the thought that one or few of the publishers, private entities would rule, which they probably already have do and have been doing in the past five or so years. Um, similar to like Google decides what we find on the internet when we do certain searches by keywords. And now the same is happening in the in the research area with literature literature search, literature searches and also them proposing what research should be done in the world to get published in certain journals. And this is already what's making some of us researchers decide for taking one or the other direction, which also threatens the academic freedom and the, the essence of what research should be here to serve for a society in terms yeah. of knowledge acquisition, and or actually serving purposes in this world. Right. Yeah, I, I would fully agree. Sometimes it seems that we must remind ourselves what uh, uh, research is ultimately about, right? So you want to change something for the better in the world in some way or the other, as this would summarize is, is it. And this is different from having these uh, self-referential games about um, uh, uh, reputation that can be measured by the number, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, research, research, um, everyday researchers are pretty much consumed by these kind of activities. So uh, um, uh, to make sure that you uh, publish in prestigious places, uh, that you have countable citations instead of uh, uh, impact on people's lives in a way that that matters for them as stakeholders on of your specific research topic, which mm -hmm. might include researchers who cite you, but also might include many different other populations. And uh, so, yeah, we 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 I think we have to remind ourselves what what is it for ultimately, mm -hmm. and also, and this is then again the librarian aspect, so to say, or the research infrastructure aspect maybe is that um, you can also help and inspire people to uh, think more about their stakeholders their original stakeholders reach out to them allow them to participate uh, participate etc and this is what we do at tib open science lab a lot so we have lots of activities and projects which are about um, this transfer of uh, researchers knowledge to the real world and vice versa and um, participatory projects and so on <laughs> I mean, you think about the custodian role that libraries play with research management, research data management, or publish the management of published articles. There's one way for researchers to publish in whichever journal. And is it then normally, an, or in a best case scenario, also the case that the library gets a copy of that article? Is that still the case in the digital era? Or, and also, so that for once, and then how do you see the, is there a discrepancy between having an institutional repository in the library 
versus um, independent repository like the ones with science open, big share, Zenodo. And is there an increasing way? I think there, there's many discussions and linking those up with each other to make them interoperable systems. But are we there yet? And do you see that as a difficult path to take and with more difficulties in the future? Or is this something that's going to be solved rather soon? Again, two questions minimum. I have questions. Yeah, yeah. Um, OK, allow me to give two answers to your two questions. Um, <laughs> So first of all, one thing we do not maybe still not talk uh, enough about um, in our space, um, the, the caretaking for researchers and their research work, let's keep it this way, <laughs> mm -hmm. which is sometimes branded as open science or librarianship, um, is that uh, we have SciHub and SciHub is a um, mighty powerful and interesting and telling phenomenon. I, uh, so you certainly hear about this also, also all the listeners I expect to that you heard about it already, which is um, a website uh, run by a lady named Alexandra Elbakian, um, who, who, uh, um, uh, uh, who also worked on the shoulders of, of, of uh, 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 anyway. So uh, SciHub is um, a website or a service where you put in a DOI, so the, the unique name of a um, science publication, and uh, you get back the full text immediately of that text. And uh, statistics show that in many countries, uh, in developing and the developing countries, developing world countries, as well as in countries like Germany, the USA, and so on, um, SciHub is used widely by many people because it's uh, an enormous easy way to get all these things. And of course, as you can imagine, um, these big publishers we already mentioned before, they try to sue them to the ground and uh, make sure that it is hardly accessible or that it is um, seems as moral problematic or um, not good to use it. So this, uh, kind, this kind of conflict that we have here. And um, it reminds us that uh, having immediate uh, um, access to all of research, to all of research is uh, kind of, um, I mean, it, it, it goes without an explanation why people use this and need this, right? And uh, this is super interesting. So, and then we have something different and you already mentioned it. So we have like uh, places like uh, institutional preprint repositories. We have um, repositories that serve a certain community in their discipline, um, in their topic area. So very traditional who came up with, with um, uh, the whole preprint con concept back then was Ellen Ginspark, who in uh, the early 1990s started the archive with an X in the name, mm -hmm. which is uh, by now really a worldwide famous preprint repository, not only for high energy physics, but for other disciplines as well who inspired lots of um, other uh, things in the field, which is in itself also super interesting because uh, um, archive started long before we had like a legal um, a concepts of creative commons licenses or policies demanding that you open your preprint. No, it was just um, uh, researchers doing piracy on their own papers by sharing them before they were published in traditional journals. So this is the roots of the super successful by now preprint movement, which, um, yeah, okay. So, uh, and uh, now the question is, uh, wh where, where does this lead us? So wh what will happen? I think one important thing that you mentioned is <coughs> open protocols. So we, uh, by now we agreed on certain APIs like, like the uh, OAI, open archives initiatives protocol for metadata harvesting um, <clears throat> and other um, we have a certain ontologies describing very well what is, is in a um, research publication and uh, all of this will be helpful to uh, um, make it easy 
to get all of research, right? And to put it in, a, in an index in a meaningful way. So on the long run, we cannot leave this to Google Scholar. This is uh, too much of a bottleneck through uh, one company owning this platform again. But instead we have to have a system where it is pretty easy basically to harvest all of research <laughs> from lots of different resources, mm -hmm. from institutional repositories, from disciplinary repositories and uh, journal platforms, whatever, and uh, to do interesting things with them because we will constantly um, have new ways to see research in context and uh, make it a uh, 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 possible and interesting new ways to discover research and to understand research in, in a digital context. Hmm. This reminds me of Open Knowledge Maps by Peter Kreiker, whom we also both know personally, um, and how they now have an institutional uh, product, so to say, where institutions can exactly do that what you just described to scrape and mirror content that's published anywhere online in open repositories. And yeah, have like one interface where they can showcase all the research that's coming out of the institution. This is quite, it's basically reclaiming ownership of what the institution has originally also invested in by providing the salaries for the researchers, the equipment with the research equipment and, um, yeah, and now it doesn't really matter anymore where the researchers publish, if it's through the library and in institutional repository or directly to a publisher or independent repositories. So that is that some a role that you, where you see yourself and your colleagues to also collect the information that's being scattered around the internet and and trying to collect it back to the institution again. Definitely, definitely. We, we, we help uh, researchers and specifically also research institutions. We help them to uh, manage their knowledge and make it accessible in multiple useful ways. Oh. So I, I think that Peter Krakas initiative is really like a picture book, picture book example of what you can do with all the data. I want to mention another one, which is uh, in a way... Um, something we contribute to for many years and uh, um, with our hearts <laughs> at the uh, TIB Open Science Lab, which is Vivo. So we care about um, these systems that help research institutions to um, Deliver, deliver stupid, boring things like reports on their research activity. Because every time you receive money from, for instance, uh, research um, science ministry of your country or from um, grant givers um, of any kind, you have to report on what you spent the money for and uh, what, what, what is actually the outcome. And you want to have beautiful researcher profiles where you can the activity of your institution's researchers in the full context. And this is uh, where uh, linked open data ontologies and open source software uh, under the umbrella of Vivo um, comes into. So we teach people that um, uh, you do not need to uh, look at uh, proprietary uh, publisher platforms to do that, who sometimes in some cases, in some ad cases, help you with this as well, but that you can um, do this by yourself and for yourself using the power of open data, open ontologies and open source software. So this is a huge worldwide consortium who uh, uh, contributes by now, also including, we, we made this po a popular thing in Germany as well, including Germany um, and uh, yeah, who make use of, of these open approaches towards uh, uh, management of, of institutional based um, research outcomes of um, uh, researcher profiles and such. Mm. Yeah, that's that's really um, uplifting to hear that there's not only more concerns and opportunities, but those actual technical access points that also researchers can use themselves to keep ownership, claim back ownership of their own research output. 
And so basically the idea is to connect it to a global knowledge base in a way that's beneficial for everyone really. Well, Absolutely, and it's also this. So, so, let me add one one thing. This is also this also connects to one thing we earlier talked about with the sovereignty of researchers and their community. Because so, um, as obvious as it might look, when um, some website asks you to uh, make a list of your research outcomes and then gives you certain categories what kind of research products or outcomes you might have. Uh, it's not that obvious, but instead, this is a very subtle question. So who um, comes up with these ontologies describing what is even imaginable or what counts as a research outcome, right? So mm. these ontologies should be in the hand of um, researcher communities. And I know this is not, not uh, everyone's favorite topic. It's a very nerdy question, but there are certainly people, as, as, as you can see when you walk through the floor, the office floor of the Open Science Lab, who uh, love to, to um, uh, work in this kind of research infrastructure and um, who wrap their uh, brains around these types of questions and engage with an exchange with researchers to um, find out, okay, how do we best describe what, 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 is, a, what is a skeleton, so to say, for the data that describes um, uh, what, what a research outcome is and that there's uh, uh, more than just a journal um, uh, article or so. so sorry for, 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 for the addition, but uh, this no, was important, important to say. Yeah, yeah thanks yeah. for adding this. Um, okay, but I, I also want to jump back to an earlier question you raised. So who owns the research? Who owns research data? This is also a question I often ask participants in research data management courses I give. And then people tend to be puzzled about that. It was like, well, I thought it was my data, but then again, and then I was like, but who paid for you working on this, like acquiring the data in the first place? And where did you get the funding from? Who provided the equipment? And do you have anything written in your in your work contract? Um, what happens once you leave the university? Can you still access? So that's also an incentive for the researchers to hack the, no, to publish the hack out of their research, to be able to access their own data after they left the university or research institution, because they might actually lose access once they leave, because they can't access the, the institutional repositories anymore from outside. And if they've published, then others, but also themselves, ourselves, can access the data limitless. Um, so what, what others are, is, are there more stakeholders that you can see of who owns research data or research output? Could be the library, library the institution, the university, the funder, the researcher, and probably all of them have a stake on the data. The publisher also, once it's published, is it owned by the publisher? If you transfer the copyright, certainly the text, but also the data that's in the text or in the supplements. Like for us, I think we really should look closely on the contracts and the agreements we sign into. Absolutely, absolutely. So, mm -hmm. Since copyright is uh, heavily in use by publishers to uh, convince um, uh, researchers to give away the control about their publication that they put so much work in or so. It's, it's um, uh, uh, still super important to, um, yeah, in a way to teach researchers about that this is, uh, that they do not must uh, subscribe to these contracts, but instead that they can, um, do different things with their publications, right? And one thing that is uh, at least as important from my perspective is to remind people that copyright policies and copyright law, whatever you think about them, or in Germany, it's Urheberrecht, which is different from copyright. But anyway, so whatever you think about this, there is lots and lots of important, very important basic stuff happening in research. Um, which is not covered by these policies at all, because facts cannot be copyrighted. And raw data, research data itself, is just 
It's a digital twin of a fact. It cannot be copyrighted. It's a public domain. And it is so, so um, and, and let's just be honest and clear about this. And every time we use it in, um, um, uh, in digital ways or so, research data, we must sure that it is not grabbed by people claiming they can own it because they can't and they shouldn't. So mm -hmm. it's, um, it's data. And uh, you can also learn it when um, using uh, um, things like uh, Wikidata, which is uh, not a database for original primary research data, but still it's an interesting fact that they uh, made it a policy that everything that enters their, their system is clearly labeled as public domain which is quite an interesting decision and should be in a positive example and, and leading example for anybody else. Mm, and indirectly, you can also use Wikibase, the software behind Wikidata for your research data. Uh, my colleague, Lozana Rosanova, just uh, last week, wrote a super interesting blog article series about this approach and um, the TIB blog. And um, what's more, let, uh, yeah, or, yeah. Sure. I, I, I just wanted to ask, can, can we put the link to the blog article into the... Yeah, yeah. So you, listeners, you will find this in the show notes. Thank you. Absolutely, absolutely. So we came across a lot of this uh, stuff, not only in the narrow um, field of research data, but also more broadly, also for cultural heritage, for instance, which is quite a little bit different, but still. So let's assume you have an oil painting from the uh, 19th century or so, right? And you digitize it in, in high resolution or so. Who owns this photo? Mm. Clearly, no one owns it because it's just a reproduction without any creative new thing in it to it. Um, and it's just there and it's effect and it's data and it's public domain. And um, so this is something we care about a lot and we must uh, somehow, since, since our world is very much structured by these rules of copyright laws and stuff like that, we have to uh, celebrate this and, and really teach people about this, that things can be free in the digital world. I mean, it's, it's even, it sounds a little bit funny if you think about it, that you have to convince people about this, right? But it's important important because it's the basis of the very basis of um, experimentation and rich work and new ways to contextualize and come up with new ideas to have all of this, uh, the, the, the raw data from the genomic sequencing of um, uh, some animal, but also the digitization of the oil painting from the 19th century, all in, um, in the public domain. And would, would it still then be necessary to cite the original painter? Or would this just be a more concern, would be nice to add, but it's not necessary? So this is super important. And here it is, uh, from my perspective, uh, it is super important to make the um, differentiation between what the law requires, where you have all, always, mm -hmm. uh, in some way or the other, state power, government power in the background that um, uh, you need to enforce it actually, on the one hand, and on the other hand, um, um, uh, let's say morals or culture. So there's a, a very strong uh, um, culture of uh, referring to one's other work. And if you do not, you do not do it properly as a researcher, you can easily lose your career, right? So if somebody finds out that you make use of someone else's data without pointing out uh, that it's not your own, but it's from exactly the source, uh, it can easily cost you your career. And this is not at all about the law. Let's be very specific about this. Copyright doesn't help in this regard, mm -hmm. but it's just, it's just so to say, <laughs> as, as if it is uh, less worse than, but uh, no, it's, it's really, it's just um, uh, things that we teach each other and which we share and um, uh, uh, have, have a tradition about um, in the way we work and we play with data. Yeah, I'm asking this also, 
So the answer would be you wouldn't have to cite the painter, but it would be recommended on moral grounds. Because your community expects it to do so. Okay. This is exactly it. And for a good reason. So so th they expect it from you for a good reason. And uh, that's it. Yeah, mostly. And, and, and then you have again, okay, this is then again mirrored in technically, uh, technicalities of it. So for instance, you have by now easy means to refer to things. So for instance, in the digital world, um, you should make sure that every... Uh, photograph of an oil pointing and every research data set has a persistent URL and mm -hmm. has um, good metadata coming along with it and so on. And this then makes it uh, really super easy with a click of a button yeah. um, to, to, uh, to refer to it explicitly. I'm also, this, I'm also asking this because in, when it comes to research data, there is a tendency towards make research data public domain accessible wherever possible. Um, whereas for texts and manuscripts, there's more there's there's more connection towards copyright and acknowledging of the work that went into creating the text and the well the brain work really. But that doesn't seem to apply so much for data sets. And yet many researchers would argue there's so much work that went into creating this data set in the first place, and then also adding all the metadata, which then only makes it valuable in the first place. Why would we publish this on a CC0, like public domain? And then again, like in many research data repositories say we only offer CC0 for data. And at maximum, maybe CC BY, but we really re recommend for you to use CC zero also to make it easily adoptable by other researchers. So there's reason for either or. But then in my conversations, I find many researchers bring reluctant and sharing then their data at all because they only have the option for CC zero and they see, oh, I won't get any, I won't receive any attribution for all the work that went into it, but people won't cite it. However, all of these CC0 only repositories say, um, please make an extra effort in citing the originators of the data sets nonetheless. Um, so basically, I'm asking, what is there really a necess necessity to differentiate between CC BY and CC0 when it comes to research data? What's your take on that? And I don't have a conclusive answer myself, so I wouldn't expect any of you. Okay, okay, yeah. First of all, I find it kind of problematic to claim CC BY uh, about your research raw data set, because in a way, uh, I would claim it's not really yours. And yeah, no, no, I think when, when data sets as, as get soon... published is normally secondary data. So that has been processed and um, okay, okay, admit it. Yeah. But still? Yeah, so, so yeah, okay, okay, good, good, good point. So you actually, yeah, you, so you make the point, as far as I understand uh, your thing here, that uh, you put, uh, you have put actual work into it, right? Yeah. So you processed it in a way, uh, so in order that it can even be published in a meaningful way, yeah, right. Yeah, that's, that's, that's true. I, I I get the point. I fully get the point. And still, and still, I doubt that it is um, appropriate. And and even um, what you really want to apply the CC BY. So applying the CC BY to you as a person means uh, an explicit words that um, if I come across anyone who uses this, uh, this without um, referring to me in a proper way, I will, uh, I might hire a lawyer and enforce this. And this is hardly what you want to say. What you want to say is you want to uh, communicate, hey, I expect everyone to uh, um, uh, apply these uh, rules that we have as a community about referring to each other works. And this is, um, uh, but, but okay, okay. So, so, so this is about the level of applying a Creative Commons license. We can argue about this. Mm. I want to make a different uh, statement 
which seems on the first look um, unrelated to this. But this is super important uh, to discuss from my perspective in this context. And this is that um, working as a researcher means to work uh, on a common good. And um, this is uh, in, many, in many cases, it's people's full-time job, literally. And we should make sure, and this is super important, that the working conditions are right and that you get paid for it. Mm -hmm. So, and this is, uh, so this is super important. So uh, with the Ich bin Hanna debate in Germany and mm -hmm. uh, the last year, we uh, uh, hopefully got a little bit more attention on this um, at last. And um, uh, so um, it is not so important to focus on the concrete outcome of what you do in the lab. So you, okay, you come up with this big data file and with proper metadata and so on. And is it really this, what you should get uh, something back for? Is it more like you work on a common good? And I, uh, think uh, it's super important to recognize that it's more the latter because in many cases just 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 to 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 uh, to um, mention one example you have lots of good and super meaningful and super necessary research which ends up in negative results which mm -hmm. hardly get referred to any anywhere because it's just, it's just not necessary it was just necessary that somebody tried yeah, and they ended up with a negative result. Oh, hopefully, yeah. they published the negative result. So what they get is uh, hopefully good working conditions from the community, from all of us, so to say, that make sure that they can uh, do this kind of research. This is this is uh, the way um, uh, this work should be uh, supported and incentivized and so on. Yeah. So this is hardly, this can, hard, so this is systemic, right? So this cannot be covered uh, or incentivized by things like um, uh, uh, references or uh, you get my point. I, I totally get your point. Thanks for exploring this. Um... Yeah, and also this extra strap, which totally makes sense. And I'll try to summarize and contextualize this from my end to hopefully make it accessible again. I'm not saying it wasn't accessible from how you pictured it. So for me, the question that we're trying to address here is what determines success in research, which then leads also to career advancement by the researcher. And what I proposed with a Author attribution, CC BY, license versus public domain research output is the CC BY author attribution allows our research output to be uh, countable, meaning by how many citations do you get for that output, which again feeds the John Impact Factor narrative, which we try and avoid. Whereas it's rather more important what you put in a CV as these are the things that I've published of my research, which are not necessarily only um, manuscripts that land in prestigious journals and as many as possible, but rather I've published a data set, I've published a registered report, I've published, um, what else, preprints, which may or may not have alternative metric scores to them, which also shouldn't matter because that's not a level, as we I think both agree, um, is not a matter a measure of quality, but still also at metrics is still only about quantity. How many people have picked up on this headline and forwarded and posted about it on the internet. Um, so then also, according to SFDORA, the San Francisco Declaration on Research Assessment, it's more important to us as researchers because, like you say, we work on public domain questions and many researchers work towards societal benefits and nowadays also very much environmental benefits to secure life on this planet um, for future generations. So therefore, it shouldn't really matter about like it shouldn't be numer numerical or measurable rather than have quality research 
and make that research accessible so that we all as humankind can learn from each other. And that sounds very morally driven, but also why not? I mean, that's what we're here for. Is that what we can conclude from the past 10 or so minutes? I think so. And the, the, the interesting thing from my perspective is that uh, this economy of um, the commons um, of, of the public domain is uh, there, there is actually a lot of research being done about this. And this is, uh, there's a lot of um, knowledge that mankind has gathered around this. So if you look at the work of um, the Nobel Prize winner uh, back then, 10 years ago, so Elinor Ostrom, right? So um, she, she wrote a lot about it. And we have to remind ourselves. So there are rules and things you can learn about how to make use of, an, of a public domain. And, um, and it's, from my perspective, yeah, as you just said, it's pretty easy to see and to understand why this concept applies to research anyway and uh, that this makes sense as a perspective to it right yeah. uh, this is not not on, not about uh, claiming uh, moral high ground that is superior to anyone else this is not the point but it's just a very pragmatic uh, worldview and um, understanding of what what research work really means and it's super uh, on spot that you mention the San Francisco Declaration on Open Research Assessment. You could also mention Leiden Manifesto. Also, these are policies that make sure that at least on the most uh, important decisions that are met by research institutions, universities, research institutions uh, of any kind, um, like hiring people, professorships, grant making decisions and so on, that uh, on these important decisions, this um, reputation number game should be kept out. And that you even, uh, since it's so popular to, to make these counts, like uh, how often uh, I was cited and so on, um, you even need to have an explicit policy that communicates very well and very clear to all the stakeholders um, that this has nothing to do with the decision making within and for the research community. And this is a huge effort and I can't, can anyone, I can just recommend to mostly to have this uh, discussion within your research institutions. Why do we not subscribe to the um, SF Dora or Leiden Manifesto. And if we already described, are we really serious about this? Do we really apply this in practice? Mm -hmm. It's super important, yeah. yeah. Um, talking about, so now we also um, mapped out the benefits and the moral grounds for open science and research integrity. Um, maybe having a side step towards the difference between fair and open, and also, are there limitations that you see, again, from your perspective, from a library viewpoint, a librarian's viewpoint, are there limitations for open science or openness within open science? Like, what kind of research output should not be published or not yet, perhaps? I'm talking about premature data that can easily be misinterpreted. Um, like, how would you respond to questions asked by that? Like, because I feel that many researchers feel insecure about, okay, do I now have to put everything I do online and have the world watch me as I conduct research on very on many regards sensitive topics? Or what does the openness, like, where does openness end? And what is the, yeah, like, what is the limitation to open science? I love your questions, Joe. I'm really in, in awe I, because <laughs> this is really it's a collection of all the tough and high level questions that you have. And, oh, not your and as, 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 as you already know, I don't have the answer on that one, right? <laughs> Be because I think it's, it's specific. It's just... <laughs> I think everyone needs to define the limitations themselves, but maybe you can point out a few. Um, hmm. Sensitive data, obviously, you won't put patient's data on mm -hmm. um, endangered animal and plant species that can otherwise be um, fall victim to predators or what's the word like for people who kill them yeah. for economic reasons. 
Absolutely, about- absolutely. No, no, I, 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 I share your point, and I, I think we need a digital culture of, um, uh, so, so especially when we ask. Uh, folks about personal information on them, which is important in many areas of research, think medical research, think uh, social sciences and so on. Mm. Um, So uh, where where I came originally from, um, we need to have a culture that makes sure that people make um, really uh, decisions on their own about this, what they want to share and to help them uh, to understand how things are used. So I'm really not on the camp of people who say, ah, this whole GDPR thing, it's just a, like a um, distraction from the important valuable work that we do. No, no, really, we, 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 we have to have digital means that make sure that people um, understand um, uh, how, how uh, their personal related information, personal related information, how it ends up in research and is being used in research. Super important question, yeah. Mm. Not, not, not exactly the main focus of my work right now at mm. TIB Open Science Lab, but still, yeah. Thank you. Okay, um, we've also met a few, I think three times I participated in the Open Science Bar Camp. This year's, uh, sadly, I couldn't join because I gave a course the same day. Um, but you're in the organizing team. Can you share like um, what the spirit of the Open Science Bar Camp is, how it's fascinating, how you came up with the idea to put something like this up? And I was being copied also on, I think not only in the Netherlands, but I know there's a, um, yeah, there's a chapter in, in the Netherlands that I think also yearly or biannually. And the Open Science Bar Camp has been on in, like before as a pre-event before the Open Science Conference um, for, is it four or five years now or more? Just count. Um, since, since uh, I, I, I think, more like eight years, <laughs> but I'm not sure. Okay, yeah. <laughs> I was late for the party. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, don't worry. No. Yeah. Uh, so, 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 yeah, it's a very basic, um, maybe very obvious idea. So, the idea is to say uh, traditional uh, events, uh, academic events at least, uh, uh, work like um, you set up a program where you have people standing in front of many, many other peoples and talking to them. And this is maybe not the best way to transfer knowledge, to allow people to learn, to come up with new ideas and such. Uh, So often it feels like at traditional conferences that some of the most important by far exchanges happen in between the sessions, in officially on -hmm. the floor of the... um, of the event site, right? And this is uh, bar camps are about to correct this. So it's a, an event that um, uh, supports a community and uh, just uh, have a meeting of people who um, are concerned about the same type of questions or who, who engage and work with the same resources in the same field and which gives them a, a space and help them to structure the space. So all of you meet, everyone is asked to give a, uh, give an idea of um, make a proposal on what to have a quick session about. And if you find out that a few other people are interested in the same topic, you have that quick session, then you have another session. So everything is planned on site, right on spot at the moment. You have... Um, um, maybe uh, nowadays um, a real-time collaborative uh, note-taking of each session and such. And uh, in reality, it's often a mixture with the traditional format. So for instance, you, uh, at the Open Science Bar Camp, we also have keynotes. Yeah? This year, it was super important for us to invite someone from scientists, uh, Science for Ukraine to yeah. tell us about... Um, how they, uh, what what their approaches are to to help um, uh, refugee researchers who um, 
who uh, had, um, are somehow harmed or interrupted also in the way they work as researchers and stuff like this, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, well, thanks for that important work also. And are there any, well, I can tell you so much. I gave two set or offered two sessions um, during the past bar camps when I attended on multilingualism. And I know that we both are also interested in the topic. Um, and I got hooked to it. So now um, I'm also in co conversations with colleagues and action groups with Africa Archive. We've launched a program with partners, Masakana, Linksys, and SC Communications, South African organizations, all of them, to translate research articles into lay summaries and from there into African languages, six of them, 480 articles. So. Um, what started as a brainstorming session at the Open Science Bar Camp is now um, transitioned to actual hands-on initiative for me and many others. Fantastic. Do Fantastic have... to learn about this. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. yeah. So it's really inspirational and the way of engagement that the bar camp format provides is really captivating and also allows, like you said, for that necessary exchange and knowledge exchange and also personal exchange between individuals who all share uh, one or the other interest. Yeah, it's an important aspect to it. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Do you have any favorite topics that you've observed that evolved in the bar camp sessions that you, well, you've always been a co-organizer? Is there something that stands out for you from the organizational viewpoint? Or have you been engaged yourself in some of the discussions which influenced your work one way or the other? If there's nothing, like, don't worry about it. If there's nothing you can pinpoint, so um, I just wanted to uh, acknowledge also the space that you and your colleagues provide with this format. But yeah. yeah, I must say it's it's really hard for me to say because uh, and and it somehow this problem now uh, to answer your question reflects uh, on the thing that um, if you organize a bar camp, you are sometimes so consumed by this um, fulfilling this role, right? That you end up uh, being very superficial with the actual content, the actual conversation happening. I guess it's, uh, that's the price of it, right? So, um, so, so, so someone has, has to have this role and uh, yeah. But, but I invite you uh, seriously to have a look at the um, pads. So we, we kept uh, collaborative notes of the sessions and uh, most obviously, uh, uh, next year, hopefully, we meet again in person at uh, Wikimedia Germany's headquarters, like traditionally in Berlin. And uh, it's much more fun to have this kind of event as a physical event, right? So as, as you know, this also has to do with um, building trust within a community and uh, having a more human way to learn and so on. So we learned a lot from, from these two bar camps where we had to do everything online. And it's important to have all of these me means in place and make the best use of them. And then again, still it's a, a super perspective and I'm um, super happy about the idea or the, at least I, I can imagine mm -hmm. to have a physical bar camp again, yeah. Uh, at, at a physical space, and, yeah. Yeah, maybe hybrid to some degree. Or maybe hybrid. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, why not? Yeah. Because this year, um, a colleague of mine from Africa was able to attend because it was online. Otherwise, for him, mm -hmm. from Kenya, it would have been difficult to come to Berlin. So that's another yeah. um, pro right. on the virtual asset. And I think hybrid is also becoming now more and more um, manageable um, now that we've all specialized in virtual events um, out of necessity and realize it's, oh, it's actually not so difficult as you might have thought before. Um, okay. Right, okay, maybe before we conclude, just one, one small excursion into the CCC, uh, I, I would say galaxy rather than ecosystem, the Chaos Computer Club, Club has a, is a German, very nerdy, may I say so. Um, community. Uh, I think they're also formalized in an NGO status, and they're fine. Um, and they organize events as an annual or biannual events, one of which is the Chaos Computer Conference. 
where we also participated in one, well, I think I've been there once, maybe twice, I can't remember. Um, and it was quite uh, an experience. So I'm sure you've attended more than once <laughs> compared with me. Um, what, what do you see academics? So what is the original nature of the Chaos Computer Club events and how can scholarship learn and contribute to such events? And what is the intersection? Again, <laughs> super interesting question. Uh, really, uh, it is. Uh, so let me first uh, quickly point out that um, so the uh, chaos event where we two met, uh, Johanna, was super important to me. Also because of um, another uh, thing that happened. Uh, so I met uh, Claudia Frick, who I mm -hmm. knew earlier. We knew each other earlier, but we met there and also Henning Krause. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, uh, so Claudia came up with this idea for Forschungsstrom. So have a look, uh, German listeners at least. Uh, this is um, a streaming show on, yeah, broadly speaking, scholarly communication and open science and everything that we have frequently uh, each month on Twitch. And it's a live video streaming format, so often very playful and, uh, yeah. Have, have, have a look at it, please. Yeah, and then more, more in general. Uh, so why, why, why is that? Why, why do you meet uh, people there like Joe and like Claudia and um, come up with good ideas? I think it's, um, yeah, it's kind of an um, explosion of ideas and creativity. And um, from the culture of these events that assume not so much and try to uh, offer diverse uh, access points to uh, certain questions and topics uh, that we have in common. Um, uh, research, researcher communities can learn a lot from it. And I see it already happening. I mean, there is a lot of experimentation on how you approach certain things. Mm. So um, what is maybe on, on the first glance, not, not directly computer chaos event related, but which I see in the continuum of, of uh, experimentation with, with events and other forms of learning also, is what... Um, Konrad Förstner and other colleagues uh, are doing with um, also Katrin Leinweber, for, former TIB colleague, um, uh, do in the space of uh, data carpentries and software carpentries, where they came up uh, in a grassroots like approach uh, with a style of teaching where you, um, within uh, one or two days or so, can learn a lot as a researcher on how to keep. Uh, your um, data tidy and uh, um, uh, keep a good overview of what is happening with your data, how you can easily get into automating things around your research data and stuff. And, uh, and I like the approach because it's not like uh, this kind of, uh, okay, uh, a computer science degree with a specialization in data science is required also, quite the opposite. It's just like um, inviting everyone who is uh, interested in a space that is very carefully crafted and trainers who l know a lot about from firsthand experience, how this uh, learning takes place about these topics and to help you to get an enhance on approach who get you to um, engage with your data in a different way. And this is, uh, I would claim it's inspired by the hacker or nerdy uh, universe in some ways. Um, I don't know how you feel about it. People like Katrin or Konrad, you may correct, or Lina Lu from TIB, you may correct me about this. But uh, to me, it feels like there's a connection uh, between the two. Yeah, yeah I, I agree. And just for the listeners who have not heard of the Chaos Computer Club culture and organization, they're mostly safe guardians of the internet. So there are also like many hackers in a positive sense. Um, so they often also actually consult for our government when there is a cyber attack here or there, because they know the insides and outsides of anything, a digital ecosystem, digital infrastructure, and how the internet, the darknet, um, 
intertwine where to draw the line, what's legal, what's illegal, um, pushing the boundaries between um, open source, closed source, more towards open. And I think that's also the intersection with open science and open source. There's a, it's not an overlap, but there's a transactory between the two movements. And I think John and some others, I don't know if you were also involved in that um, article, there um, at some point also contributed to that to that paper um, to compare, to analyze where the open source movement came from and how then the open science movement docked into that evolution and learn from it and how the two movements or ecosystems can inform each other in exactly a sense that you described of what the um, chaos computer conference and other events provide for engagement and exchange of knowledge and experiences. Great. Um, yeah, any concluding remarks? <laughs> um, it's difficult to come to a closing after such a rich and insightful discussion. Thank you so much for, for that, for sharing your thoughts on so many different topics. Thank you. you uh, this was, was a pleasure. Maybe one very last thing that I would like to mention at the very end. Um, so another format that is somehow inspired by the hacker ethos, maybe, or hacker practices or so, uh, which I engage in is um, book sprints. This is another thing. So where you have like um, the concept of inviting experts over for a few days, just for three or five days, to gather physically at one space, and you guide them through the process of writing a textbook or a guide on their uh, area of knowledge, yeah, mm -hmm. in a very, very um, uh, structured, well-structured way, result-oriented, and people are always or very often amazed by how this works and you that you do not need to uh, write ed educational or introduction materials or handbooks in this way that you isolate isolate it, uh, yourself from another and uh, sitting at your own desktop at home or in the office but instead to meet and have this as an agile process and it's a lot of fun and super interesting experience mm. so i did this several times now and I can only recommend if you have the need for a guide or a textbook from your field or so, please consider um, having a book sprint on it. It's, um, it's an interesting experience, at least, and it's highly productive. It's also what John Tennant, again, um, postulated a couple of years ago, um, called it a massive open online course. MOOCs. Or is, yeah, no, well, which then turned into community, but the mm. writing mm. effort, MOOC, I think, yeah, it was called MOOC, mm. Massive Open Online Manuscripts or Publications. Right? So there's also, yeah. a man, right, we put this also in the show notes, so you can look it up, which I think works along the lines that you described for the book sprint. You can also use that for research manuscripts. <coughs> yeah. Yeah, when you have a large uh, community and invite everyone or so, a little bit like in Wikipedia or so, uh, other rules apply and it's a little mm -hmm. bit different, but still it's also great. So with the book sprint, the special thing is that you uh, set a small team of experts by inviting them. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but that's, uh, but uh, anyway, it's uh, super interesting to think about Wikipedia and Wikipedia like um, editorial processes as well yeah mm -hmm. thank you okay i'm looking forward to our next conversation just to set the stage for a follow-up um whenever you're ready um maybe two three words about what's next for you what are the projects you're currently working on if you can already share um or yeah and how do you see the not so far future for open science what's the next big chapter Oh, yeah, good questions. So one thing that uh, um, um, I have in mind for this year is we will have a hackathon on 3D data in this NFTI space, so the, the National Research Data Infrastructure Program. 
Um, this will be interesting, but we have not come out yet with the save the date, but hopefully soon we will. This will happen this year. And to have these hackathon-like events for such a um, official funded kind of activities like the NFDI in Germany, I think it's super important. Also to, to get people to learn how learning and transfer of knowledge today really happens and why uh, uh, things like hackathons. And here we are again with the hacker ethos and chaos uh, things and so on. But why this is really... Um, Mm, not just a funny marketing event, but really meaningful. Mm -hmm. This is something that I'm uh, currently thinking a lot about and, and work work about, work on. And um, another thing more in general is, uh, yeah, what we talked about also at the very beginning. So I see myself as part of a community that is increasingly people who have it how, somehow in their official job description that they do open science. And uh, then again, I'm uh, really concerned, concerned about that we um, share a vision and, uh, are, um, and open up to uh, discuss uh, maybe also problematic uh, things that happen in and around us uh, like, for instance, this um, data grabbing of publishers and so, and uh, there's no no easy reset to that, right? But this is something that uh, that I'm thinking about quite often, and uh, maybe um, this uh, podcast was also a super nice opportunity to to uh, discuss this openly and reflect on this. So I, I value uh, Joe also your. Uh, work also as, as an active member of this community. And uh, this is really valuable to, to have these uh, conversations out in the open. I, I uh, uh, th th thank you a lot for, for, for having me and uh, um, so that we have this opportunity to, to, to talk it through. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks also for again, sharing your thoughts on this. this is, yeah. It's also valuable for me. And I always learn a lot with every guest. Um, so it's also a manifestation of. What I personally consider as important to consider when we talk about open science, and I yeah, again, my my world and viewpoints expand every time with every conversation. So thank you. Great. Okay, so um, up to the next episode for the listeners, and um, see you soon online and hopefully also in real life. <laughs> at the next see event. you yeah <laughs> or for coffee when we meet in berlin or in hanover definitely definitely yeah